Psalm chapter 7. Have you ever in your life been falsely accused of something? Someone made an accusation against you. Maybe it was at work. Maybe it was within your family and, and you are alienated amongst your own family now because of this false accusation that was made against you. Yesterday I asked some people to share some different stories and some real life experiences that they've had with being falsely accused. And one person that reached out to me just reminded me of what I, what I think is one of the most extreme examples um, of being falsely accused. And I asked, I said, you know, do you mind if I share it? And he said, of course, I, I don't mind at all. And some of you uh, have had the benefit of meeting Greg Wilson. He's a church planner in Manchester that we support as a church. Uh, been a friend of Church on the Way for a long time. And Greg has a very interesting testimony. Um, Greg's dad <clears throat> was the ringleader of a very large fraud operation. Um, hundreds of homes and lots of money that, that he got through fraudulent ways. And when he was finally caught by the FBI, he, uh, you know, the FBI will often say, who, who else is a part of this? And we'll reduce your sentence. And his dad implicated him. His dad went to prison. Greg's brother went to prison. Greg's uncle went to prison. Greg's grandfather went to prison. And like 15 other people went to prison. Because they were all implicated directly into the fraud that was happening. But Greg had no idea. Greg was clueless of what was going on. And Greg said that uh, what was interesting and, and surprised him was the amount of shame that he experienced being accused of this federal crime, even though he was innocent. Like he knew in his heart that I didn't do it, but it didn't really matter because everything around him looked like he was going to take the fall and be implicated by his own father, right? I mean, this is, I, I told him, I said, I, I feel like this is the making of some kind of TV crime series, right? Like all of these different players and different people orchestrating this event, and you just get caught up in that net, even though you didn't do anything wrong. Thankfully, he was eventually uh, proven innocent, and um, did not go to prison, but spent a long time sweating that out and, and dealing with some of the consequences of that. Because, again, even if you're accused, you end up in the papers, right? And, and what do so many people think when they read things in the paper? Well, it must be true. Even though there's never a conviction, you're still walking around with that stigma with the people that you know. Another person shared a story of being in the military and being accused of doing something. And even though he knew he was right and knew that they didn't do anything, the, the commander that was in charge just refused to apologize. And, and they said, even to this day, it bothers them a little bit of being falsely accused of stealing a jacket. <laughs> right? There's something about being falsely accused that, that is one of the most painful and frustrating experiences that human beings can go through. And this morning, that's where we find David. And, and it's interesting that with everything we've gone through so far in the psalm, this is the most desperate that David is. More desperate than his depression last week or his affliction, whatever he was struggling with. This, the, these words uttered by this man 
have, have caused David to just be in utter despair. And it's, it's only at the last possible second in the psalm, in the last verse, do we get a, any kind of turn back toward God. Because again, there, there's just something about being falsely accused that, that it just nags at us, right? We, we wrestle in our mind, did I, did I do that? Was that my intent? Well, maybe I just did it unconsciously. Maybe I didn't even realize I was doing it, right? We just, we wrestle with those thoughts and it weighs us down. And this morning, you're going to see if your ultimate hope is not in God, then your anxiety will consume you when you can't reverse injustice. When you can't set the record straight. Because listen, you can't always set the record straight. As my friend who was in the military, the record still isn't straight. He never got an apology. And sometimes that's the way it is. Sometimes you go through your whole life just with those accusations hanging over your head, even though they may be completely unfounded. They're always there. Always in the back of your mind, always in the back of other people's minds. And so if you're not resting and your ultimate hope is not in God, then what, what I've seen is, is your anxiety will just consume you. Because you're constantly worrying about what other people think. Do these people know? Do they have any idea? Did they read the news stories? Do they have any clue about this? If you're not looking to Jesus, if you're not looking to God as your ultimate hope, you're going to be racked with anxiety. I want to break this passage up before we read it. For those of you who like to take notes, I'm going to break it up into four sections in Psalms. First, we're going to see in verses 1 and 2, David's call for help. This should be something, as we've gotten to Psalm 7, that should be somewhat common to us. Um, and we're going to see it again and again and again throughout the book of Psalms. A call for help. But second, in verses 3 through 5, we're going to see a call for personal judgment. A call for personal judgment. Judgment. This is important. This is something that separates the Christian worldview from our culture at large. Third, we're going to see a call for judgment <laughs> in this situation, in verses 6 through 9. Well, really, 6 through 16. And then finally, we're going to see, in verse 17, a call for worship. So with this put this up on the screen, and it's been our custom. We'll read through Psalm 7 together as a church, starting in verse 1. Read, read with me. O Lord my God, in you do I take refuge. Save me from all my pursuers and deliver me. Lest like a lion they tear my soul apart, rending it in pieces with none to deliver. O Lord my God, if I have done this, if there is wrong in my hands... If I have repaid my friend with evil or plundered my enemy without cause, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it, and let him trample my life to the ground and lay my glory in the dust. Selah. Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. Awake for me. You have appointed a judgment. Let the assembly of the peoples be gathered about you. Over it return on high. The Lord judges the people. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to my, the integrity that is in me. O let the evil of the wicked come to an end, and may you establish the righteous, you who test the minds and hearts, O righteous God. My shield is with you, God. He saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. 
He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head, and on his own skull his violence descends. I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of the Lord the Most High. Amen. So David starts out here in verse 1 and 2 with a call to a call for help, a, a call that he is in distress. Now there's, there's a little subscription in your Bible, some of your Bibles maybe, um, which kind of gives us a context and a little bit of a clue of what's going on in this psalm. And it talks about this song that David is singing to the Lord concerning the words of Cush, a Benjamite. Now, the tribe of Benjamin was the tribe of King Saul. He, King Saul, for those of you who don't know, tried to either kill David or have David killed multiple times, right? The Lord had appointed David to be the king. Saul was currently the king. And Saul thought in his own self and his own power, well, if I just get rid of this guy, I can keep being king and my family line can continue to do that. And, and so multiple times we see in the Old Testament Saul trying to kill David. And, and if you look at where Saul's power base is, right, if you think about politics, everybody's got their little power base, a little group. Well, that was this tribe, the, the tribe of Benjamin. His tribe was his power base. These, these were the people that were always in his corner no matter what. And even after Saul was killed by the Philistines, Israel was divided by a civil war between those who were loyal to David and those who were loyal to Saul. And which tribe do you think was spearheading the civil war? The tribe of Benjamin, right? These were the, this was the group that was standing in opposition of David. Eight years this went on. This, this struggle. And so there's a history here. When, when we read these words concerning the words of Cush, a Benjamite, right? The, the Benjamite part, it, Cush doesn't matter that much. Who exactly he was doesn't matter. What matters in that description is that he was a Benjamite. So this is a person who would have been personally, culturally, his whole tribe would have been offended by David's rule. And so you can just imagine David is now king, right? The civil war is over. His kingdom is, is established. And what do losers often do? They like to talk trash, don't they? They like to criticize every decision that they don't agree with. Anytime they perceive weakness, anytime they perceive like, ah, oh, maybe that wasn't the right decision, they have the benefit of hindsight, right? They're not making the decision in the moment. They're looking back and going, man, a better decision could have made. You could be a better leader, David. Saul would have never made that mistake. Right? We don't know exactly what it was that Cush said to Saul, but, but there was some kind of false accusation made against him. And so there is a history here between the tribe of Benjamin, this person named Cush, and King David. And again, while David may know full well, I was right, I did the best I could in that situation, he does what we all do, right? Whenever somebody, you can get, a, out of 100 people, 99 people can come up to you and say, man, you did a great job. And one person can walk up to you and say, I think you could have done better. Who do you think about for the next few days? The 99 or the one? Right? It's human nature. It's who we are. It, it eats at us, right? I, I've, I've counseled and talked to so many pastors that literally had one person in their church just suck the joy out of ministry because they knew every Monday morning they were going to get an email. It was too hot in the building. It was too cold in the building. 
You preached a little long this week. Right? They're, they're, just that one. And I talked to them, so tell me about the rest of your church. Oh, it's great. It's wonderful. But, but their heart and their soft focus is on that one. And that's what's happening with David here. He's, he's focusing on that one. So David's going to show us through this psalm how to deal with these kind of nagging people. Right? Maybe, maybe they're not making false accusations against you. They're just kind of questioning everything you do. I'm sure you have somebody like that in your life. Right? And so David's going to walk us through how to handle ourselves in that situation the first thing we see is we got to call for help this is where most of us go wrong most of us think we can handle it we can deal with it on our own that we'll figure it out but that's not what david does david knows himself all too well and so what does he do he cries out to god Save me from all my pursuers and deliver me, lest like a lion they tear my soul apart, rending it in pieces with none to deliver. Guys, sometimes it just amazes me the words David uses to describe internal feelings. This is one of those moments, right? Deliver me, lest like a lion they tear my soul apart. Isn't that what it feels like when you're being falsely accused of something? If you've ever been in that situation? Isn't that what it feels like when they're just needling you? They're just nagging you about, shouldn't you have done this? Or maybe you could do a little bit better. It's like your soul is just being just ripped apart. Sometimes, sometimes incredibly slowly. And this is why it's important, husbands and wives, that we watch our words to each other. Because this is what it feels like sometimes. To be constantly questioned, to be constantly nagged, to be constantly discredited. Especially in front of other people. This, this, this idea of having your soul, your soul just torn apart. David, he calls out for help. He cries out for help. And that's the first thing we need to do. We, we don't need to be ashamed or embarrassed to go to God in our weakness. And to go to God and just say, God, we, we need your help. I can't do this. Humble yourself. God lifts up the humble. He resists the prideful. So the first thing we need to do is just call for help. But second, we see in verses 3 through 5, and then a little later down in the passage here, there's a call for personal judgment. Verse 3, notice David isn't going to God saying, God, I need your help because I didn't do anything. It was all their fault. They're the ones that, that made the mistake. They're the ones that, that are saying all this stuff. It's not about me. It's about them and what they've done. That's not what David does, is it? No, in, in verse 3 he says, if, if I have done this, if there is wrong in my hands, if I repaid my friend with evil or plundered my enemy without cause, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it. Let them trample my life to the ground and lay my glory in the dust. What's David doing there? Well, he's doing something that we see practiced and, and prescribed by Jesus in the New Testament. Namely, take the log out of your own eye before you start taking the speck out of somebody else's eye. And this is one of the things that separates the Christian world. Okay, this is one of the things that should separate the Christian worldview from the culture at large. Is that in every situation, we go into that situation going, God, I know I'm a sinner. And probably in some way, I have sinned in this moment. Husbands, it may not have been what you said, but it may have been how you said it.
Maybe there is some aspect of the way in which you communicated what may have been biblical truth, but you did it in a way that was sinful. Right? So, David is calling us, he's calling himself, he's calling God, judge me. Help me to see my heart. Help me to see where I may have been desiring something to happen in this situation, even though I I, I wasn't even aware I was consciously acting on it, but man, my heart's sinful. And maybe there's some motivation, maybe there's some shred of truth to what this person is saying. And maybe that's why it's bothering me so bad. Right? Sometimes... Sometimes we may be guilty, we we may not be guilty of doing a bad thing to a person, but we may be guilty of desiring a bad thing happening to that person. Does that make sense? And so you kind of take some joy in their suffering. You take some joy in their blunder. Again, this is why we need to be taking the log out of our own eye first. We, we need to be going to God and asking God, God, where, where in this situation have I done wrong? Now, David is claiming igno- innocence here. I, I didn't do it. But we, we need to ask God, to judge our hearts. Those of you who have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you have been given the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit resides and lives within you. He is there to help you, to convict you, not to accuse you. There's a difference between being accused and being convicted, okay? Our enemy is the accuser. If you walk around all the time and you just feel like this, don't blame that on the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit will convict you of sin and you'll go, oh, I shouldn't have done that. But call out to him, ask it, help me evaluate my heart. You live there. What do you see? What's going on in in the innermost parts of me when it relates to this person? We need to examine our hearts. And if you find yourself in a situation where you are falsely accused, one of the things that might extend your shame and your suffering is if there is a shred of truth. Maybe not the whole accusation, but there is a little piece of it that you need to confess and repent of. And until you do, it's going to linger with you. So do what David does and call out to God. God, help me. Personally, judge me. From there, though, David shifts gears. He's claiming his conscience is clean. So now... He's just calling for judgment, right? He, he, he wants judgment to come in this situation. He wants God to act. Now, there are two kinds of judgments here that David is referring to. And it's important that we see both and we understand their differences and we understand their benefits. The first thing he is calling to and reminding us of is the final judgment. There is going to be a day of the assembly. There's going to be a day when all wrongs will be made right. That day is coming, right? That's a future judgment. There's a day in the future coming in which every wrong thing will be made right. That should give believers a lot of hope. Because we don't have to worry about reversing injustice. We don't have to re- worry about clearing our name, ultimately. But we are a people who like instant gratification. And so David reminds us that there's another kind of justice too. There's not just the justice of the final day. That that day is coming. Nothing is going to change that day. But in addition to that, we see in verses 10 through 16 that God's judgment is not just for the final day. 
that there is also judgment that is happening now. We see that in verse 12. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant in, with mischief, and God gives birth to lies. He makes a pit, digging it out, and then falls into it. Right? He's falling. In. This is active, ongoing judgment. His mischief returns upon his own head, and on, on his own skull, his violence descends. So David is reminding us, he's calling out to God for justice, both final justice, where he is ultimately going to be vindicated, but also earthly justice. That the people who do wrong over and over and over again don't just get away with it. Again, I, I think about Greg's situation. Greg's father defrauded hundreds of people out of their life savings. And we could say, well, okay, he, one day, one day he's going to be judged. But yeah, but in addition to that, praise God, he's in prison. Suffering right now, wallowing around in the pit that he dug for himself. And this is important, and we need to be careful when we just think, well, you know, we, we can do these things and we can get away with these things because, you know, yeah, God will judge us one day. But no, listen, he'll, he can also judge you today. There are times in our lives when we reap what we sow. That is an old biblical principle that's not gone away. And if you keep reaping judgment, expect judgment. Every day in this world, God brings judgment on evil. It's not just a one-time event in the future. And this, this truth is what gives David hope. David is struggling. He is in despair. He feels like his soul is being ripped apart because of these false accusations made by Cush against him. And all through this psalm, David, David is, is wrestling. David is torn until the very last verse. Which makes me think, why the turn? Why, why the sharp turn at the very end? The reason for the sharp turn is because every day, Every day, God is bringing judgment on evil. Not, not the ultimate judgment. That day is coming. But every day, God is bringing judgment on evil. Every single day, people are being sentenced to prison. Every single day, people are being arrested for crimes that they have committed. This is a picture, a small picture, a, Again, they don't catch everybody. But it's a small picture of a day that is coming when every injustice will be made right. And that injustice may be made right by a person suffering for eternity. Because when you sin against an eternal being, the only consequence to that is eternal suffering but praise god for some of us and i hope all of you when you stand before god that day jesus is going to step in front of you and say i've already taken his punishment i've already taken his wrath And as believers, just as this passage calls us to do, right? He says what? Get my notes out of order here. If a man does not repent, verse 12, 
This, this is how we live a righteous, ongoing life as a sinner. Right? Just because you have accepted Jesus, just because He is your Savior, just because He is the one that you are looking to for your hope, that doesn't mean you're perfect now and you no longer sin. If that's what you think, whew, you are so delusional that it's going to take the Holy Spirit to get through your thick head. Because we are sinners. But praise God, you could go read a little book like 1 John and understand that God knows that you're a sinner and that he made provisions for you as a sinner. And that provision is the ability to repent. To confess your sin and then to turn away from your sin. And this is how we live a life that is at peace with God. It's at peace living in a world where we may be falsely accused. Living in a world where we may have people who, who are second-guessing everything we do. But as we turn to God and we ask God, God, judge me. Let, let the Holy Spirit search my heart. You find anything, let me confess and repent of that. Otherwise, if we don't, that judgment may happen to us here. Now, as believers, that ultimate judgment will be taken care of by Jesus, but that doesn't mean we won't have consequences in this life. Right? You, you try to sell some drugs to make some quick cash to pay your mortgage, and you get caught. Try telling the cops, listen, I confessed and repented right after I did it. We're good. Right, you're going to jail. Right? There's still going to be consequences in this life. That, that judgment still may fall upon you. That doesn't mean God's forsaken you. That actually just means the system is working. And David seeing that, and David reminding himself of that, and David knowing that about God, in verse 17, leads him to call to worship. I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of the Lord the Most High. God's judgment today should comfort us as believers. Granted, human justice is imperfect in so many ways. I see it every single day. But the fact that there is some justice in this world should be a reminder to us and give comfort to us who are believers to know that one day there is an ultimate day of justice that will be perfect there will be no legal loopholes for some lawyer to figure out a way out of there, there will be no buying off the judge because money won't matter and so when we see God's, just, just God's judgment today, it should bring us comfort and lead us to worship. This is what David bases his personal call to worship on. Nothing has changed, right? Nothing has changed. Cush is probably still lying about him. But at this point, David has changed. And this is what happens when we call for help. We... we Ask God to personally judge us first. Then we ask him to do justice in this situation, right? We remind ourselves of the righteousness of God and the faithfulness and the fact that he is a just judge, right? When we do that, what have we done? We are changing what we are looking at. We are changing what we are focusing on. David begins this psalm by focusing on the words of Cush. That's all he can see. And again, if you've ever experienced that false accusation, it's there with you the moment you wake up. It's all you think about. And instead, what David has done as he's walked us through this psalm, as he's walked us through how to deal with being falsely accused, with having someone lie about you, is he's gotten us to this place at the end where nothing has changed. But David has changed on the inside. 
The externals, same. But the internal, completely different. His heart is no longer set on the situation. Instead, his heart is set on God. And this morning, if you're here, and maybe you've been falsely accused, and maybe you're still struggling with it, I want to encourage you to take your eyes off of the situation and put them squarely onto God. God's righteousness is our only hope. I don't... I don't want to even begin to imagine a world where there is no final justice. Sometimes I think about people who don't know Christ and it breaks my heart because I I can't imagine living in a world that hopeless. Think about it. If you're walking around and you're one of the Millions of people in this country that just don't believe in God, don't care about God, just going to do my own thing. Do you understand why they're so hopeless and depressed? Because they don't see a point in the future in which all things that are wrong will be made right. Man, what a hopeless way to live my life. You can understand why they get to the place of thinking nothing really matters. I can do whatever I want. Because there is no ultimate judge. There is no ultimate courtroom. There is no making all things right. I might as well do what makes me feel good now. And all they're doing is heaping judgment upon judgment upon judgment upon themselves. Guys, that should break your heart for the people in your life that don't know Jesus. It should not make you walk out of here feeling arrogant and and better than. It should make you feel broken. And I pray this morning that that brokenness would drive you to sharing the good news of the gospel. The good news that starts with the bad news. (laughs) That we're all sinners. Every single one of us. We all need a Savior. We can't save ourselves. But when we call out for help, He is faithful. He is faithful to save us. And not only to save us, but, but to have Jesus one day step in front of the ultimate judge and say, I'm I'm covering this sin I took the punishment for him or for her and that should motivate you drive you to want to share that with your friends with your family with your loved ones thinking about the fact that they're going to be standing before a holy righteous God completely alone This morning, if you're struggling with being accused, having people lie about you, I encourage you, turn away from this, the situation and turn to God. Trust in His judgment. Not only ultimate judgment, but judgment today. And let that bring you joy. Let that bring you hope. But also let that drive you to evangelize the lost. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your words here in Psalm 7, God. Father, I thank you for just how practical they are to our lives. Thank you for giving us your word to help us to navigate this life. And Father, I just want to pray for anyone here who has been falsely accused, God. Maybe it's something that's that's hung over their life for years. God, this morning I just I pray they would turn away from that situation and turn to you. 
They would, they would fix their eyes on your righteousness and your justice, God. And Lord, that would bring them hope this morning. And as they continue to call out for help in the days and weeks to come, Lord, I pray that you would help them to overcome the anxiety, the, the feeling as though their soul is being ripped apart. And they will have a peace, God, that can only come from you. And Father, for, for those that are here this morning that don't know you, Father, I, I do not wish your justice upon any of them, God, because none of us can withstand it. We need a Savior. We need your Son, God. And I pray your Holy Spirit would open up their hearts, God, and they would just call out to you. Just like David in this psalm, they would call out for help this morning. They would turn away from their sin and turn toward you, Lord. And Father, I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.